Okay, so Pi News episode 67, and uh, we've had another update to Android on Raspberry Pi. So we've got Android 13, and I did a video on how to set up uh, and install apps with Aptoid and various other things, did a lot of testing on it. The next update, which came very soon after, so August 26th, uh, if we scroll down through, you can see here, so the Mesa 3D graphics drivers got updated, and also that included Vulkan 1.2. Uh, so this is really early on because we've only recently found out that the Pi 4 got Vulkan 1.2 compliance. So really, really good to see on that. And it looks like they fixed a Vulkan related issue on Chromium based browsers. Now I did have a problem with Edge when I tried it and I ended up using Puffin. So maybe I need to have a look at that again. Now if we scroll down, uh, I had a comment on one of my videos uh, about this. Uh, in case it helps anyone, I used this for the G apps. Uh, and there's a, a link Then I sideloaded to obtain my GSF ID then I had to go to Google to register the GSF ID now I've tried this and I couldn't get it to work um, so I've got the Play Store on here but uh, I can't get the ID uh, so if I go in and go to sign in it won't let me because the device isn't registered for Play Protect. So I downloaded loads of apps actually it's on another build uh, but one of them is device ID which was the one that was recommended in the comment but the trouble is that it doesn't come up with the Google service framework. And I downloaded about six other apps to try and get this. If you can get this, uh, then you'd be able to access the Google Play Store. Now, I know not everybody wants the Google Play Store on Android, but I like it because uh, I paid for quite a few apps on there. And obviously, there's apps that are only available there. Now, I installed the Dolphin emulator from Aptide and uh, got it working with Vulkan selected, but uh, it wasn't really an improvement on performance. So hopefully in the future, we'll be able to see a better performance on that. I've definitely had better performance with GameCube using Lacquer. Uh, Lacquer is really quite usable, um, and that doesn't use Vulkan, that uses OpenGL. But we'll keep watching it because the project gets regular updates, and uh, also there may be some games that it really improves. So I need to maybe have a look at what games uh, use Vulkan and maybe improve by having Vulkan 1.2 compliance. So I'm going to switch back over to my usual build KDE Plasma because the web browser experience is better on Linux. Now next up uh, is something really impressive for a Pi 400. So from the Top Mankalanx channel on YouTube, he always puts together 3D cases for Raspberry Pi and does a really, really good job. Uh, some of the best cases you can find. Now he sent me an email which shows this Pi 400 case and this is such a cool project. I need to start 3D printing this out and giving this a try. Uh, so basically it's to have a two and a half inch, so a standard SSD or a uh, like a laptop hard drive size to be able to put under the Pi 400. You see it's got a lovely tilt there as well uh, to make the keyboard slightly raised up. Um, but if we have a look through some of the pictures here, uh, you can see on the back that there's provision for the cable to go through and everything. So it's really nice and neat. And it looks like vents on the side, on the bottom as well, below the drive. You can see that it's still using the excellent aluminium heatsink which goes on top of the CPU, uh, which keeps the Pi 400 really cool. It is so good for overclocking a Pi 400. And a bit more detail to what it looks like inside. So still quite a bit of room in there underneath. And as you can see, it was no easy task because it's got these extra little bits here, uh, which you can see which attach to the main board of the Pi 400 and then it all goes together. Really, really impressive. I'll put a link to the, in the description uh, to the video and the YouTube channel that this is from, but I will be definitely having a look at this in the future and giving it a try. And there's loads more pictures in this article as well. So thanks very much for that. That is very exciting, I really want to have a look at that. Next up from Hackaday, we had this really cool looking Raspberry Pi handheld and uh, if we scroll down, you can see it looks really, really smart. Inside the well-designed layered 3D printed case is the frequently chosen Raspberry Pi 4 along with a Pi Sugar power supply board and 5000 milliamp hour battery and a 4.3 inch touchscreen display. Does look really cool. Another Hackaday story, uh, this share screen to RGB panel. So basically with a Pico W, it can display an image uh, and a moving image on the screen. I think there is a video on here as well. Today we are going to you play can see around there's, uh, with the there's a bit about how it's created and all put together to share our and this very cool display and I better pause it, I won't play much more of it. But it's got this uh, 3D printed sort of housing that it goes into and if we scroll on a bit, 
There's something about low res displays that still looks cool. The matrix. And here you can see it's showing it the animated. Is terrible and Quite a low refresh rate, but again, still looks cool. And that looks like Rick Astley there. Now this isn't really a Raspberry Pi story, although we have seen the Compiz window manager on Raspberry Pi before. It's basically had an update after two years and you can see this cube design here. So if I go to my video, in, so this was uh, Phoenix Linux and uh, it was an OS which looked very different to everything else, looked really cool. And we had various different iterations of it come through, but this bit was the bit that really impressed me. So this is multiple desktops and you can see uh, we've got a calculator on one screen, we've got a terminal on another but you can actually turn it into a 3D cube and, and spin it around. And this is something that was around, uh, I think the article says like 10 years ago, but uh, yeah, just there's something about it. It was, really, it was really good fun to play around with on the Pi. It was a really nice OS, lots of good things about it. Uh, and there was, it was very customizable. So if you like uh, sort of playing around with different transitions and effects and things like that. So hopefully that'll be incorporated into some other operating systems in the future. Um, but uh, I'm sure Phoenix Linux is still available. I'll put a link to that video I just showed uh, so you can find out where to download it. Now this is cool. Uh, so this is an Octopod, which as you can see, it's an MP3 player. You can see it with some headphones here and there's, uh, looks like a lithium battery in there. And you can see it's got some software on there to be able to browse through the tracks. So I always wanted a portable open source device that I can customize and use. So after a month of study and learning, this is what I got. Portable lossless player with Raspberry Pi Zero 2W, Diet Pi, 512 storage, 3500 milliamp hour battery and a 2.8 inch touchscreen. So a nice project if you're looking to try out something like that yourself. This was cool from the Raspberry Pi official site. Don't try this at home, overclocking an RP2040 to one gigahertz. So this is the processor that comes in the Raspberry Pi Pico. David Bell is one of our interns and is equipped with one of the office Peltier coolers. He decided last week to indulge in some experimentation to find out how much he could overclock an RP2040. And it says here, overclocking it as David describes here will also stop it working altogether. So obviously don't do this if you, if you want your device to be still working. And there's some benchmarking here. To minimize temperature, I used a Peltier cooler to get the temperature down to minus 40 degrees. And you can see close up, it all frozen here. Now I mentioned in a previous video about this very cool keyboard, which takes a Pi Zero 2W or a Pi 4 in it. I will be definitely doing a video in the future, but I spotted this on the same website, Raspberry Pi Plastics. And this is a little seven inch display and a keyboard that kind of closes up. Simply connect the bracket to the underside of your new touchscreen case and you have a compact workstation. And it does look pretty cool. There's a bit here, I don't know how well this is going to run on here. Oh yeah. So you can see like you can close it up or you can open it up as a little seven inch touchscreen device. Very nice. I like the look of that. Bit of new software. Um, they actually mentioned it about an Orange Pi 3. Uh, but uh, this is Manjaro ARM 22.08 and if we scroll down in the story, currently supported by Raspberry Pi 4 Model B, a Raspberry Pi 3 and Raspberry Pi 400. A lot of people like Manjaro, it is a cool operating system. Next up, I had an email from Eric from the this GitHub, so RetroPie Extra, and this is a way of installing extra things into RetroPie. After many hours of testing and fixing, RetroPie Extra had been cleaned up and all the scripts are now working. We now have a nice GUI, the ports have been cleaned up to only have games imports and other things like Office and web browsers in the supplementary section. Tested all the browsers and they do work, YouTube works on Chromium, and various other fixes in there. But I'll put a link to the GitHub in the description. So if you want to try that out, I have shown it in a previous video. I can't remember which video I did, um, but uh, maybe I'll put a link to that video if I can find it. Now this was uh, another message I had, and this is from Pepe from the Cerro. So I was playing with the USB boot thingy on my Pi Zero 2W and discovered something. Whenever the board has no SD card inserted and there is a USB drive connected, it boots from this, the Raspberry Pi will check constantly if an SD card is present. And by doing that, it will use eight to 10% CPU utilization, maybe higher. You can check this easily just looking at the board, LED blinking in a pattern. You can also check this with the top command, a process named Kworker at the very top must be visible. There is a solution though, you just need to add, and there's some scripts in here, to the config.txt. This parameter should tell the board to only check for an SD card once at boot. While I was trying to play music on the Pi, there was a kind of distortion, and who would have thought the culprit was this process? 
And it looks like it's also mentioned in this blog by James A. Chambers. So I'll put a link to that in the description as well. Now back in Pi News 65, uh, I had this story about Raspberry Pi in stock at RS. So this came up, I did a search for Raspberry Pi 4 chip shortage, and this advert came up for UK RS Online. Uh, 29 Raspberry Pi available. Actually, when I clicked on it, they weren't available, and I actually showed it in the story, and there was no availability at all. But uh, it's interesting because this story came up uh, just like two or three weeks later. Raspberry Pi manufacturer RS Group ends license after a decade. RS Components has been a manufacturer and distributor of Raspberry Pi since its launch in 2012. And so they've been with Raspberry Pi for a long time, um, but are no longer doing it. But I just thought it was a bit strange that not long before there was an advert that came up on Google and there didn't seem to be any stock. Uh, and I don't know if the two are related, but I just thought it was a bit strange, thought I'd mention it. Did you end up pre-ordering a Pi from RS? Uh, because they were still taking orders when I checked on the site. Uh, and have you got your money back yet? Next up from Petapixel, 3D printed 12 megapixel camera runs Linux and can be operated from anywhere. This is quite a cool looking piece of kit. A computer science student with a passion for electronics and photography has created a 3D printed 12 megapixel camera. So it's built around a Raspberry Pi 4 with 8 gig of RAM using a Linux desktop operating system. The Pi HQ camera houses a Sony stacked backside illuminated image sensor and 4K video. Good luck with recording 4K video on a Pi 4. I suppose maybe if you lowered the uh, frame rate a lot. Also out of the 16mm C-mount telephoto lens and you can see there's loads of bits and loads of information in here so if you're looking at doing this sort of project this would be a good place to look. It's also controllable remotely as well as you can see here and it can be operated from anywhere in the world. Another Tom's Hardware story, Maker creates DIY Raspberry Pi Pico GPIO Ethernet connection. So if we have a look here, you can see there's an Ethernet here, Raspberry Pi Pico, Twitter user Twy Kingyo doesn't need a Raspberry Pi Pico W to get network connectivity. Today we're showing a clever project they've created using a regular Pico wired to an Ethernet adapter via its GPIO. While this is only a partial connection, the testing so far shows promising results. Very impressive. And again, there's details in there if you want to recreate that yourself. And last up, uh, a bit of a strange one. This is not Pi related. I had an Osbot camera sent to me, which I did a video on, and really enjoyed it. It's a really smart camera that tracks your motion. It actually moves around to follow you. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I had four comments all at exactly the same time from four separate people, all recommending the IO Coco webcam. So uh, yeah, it's a bit of a strange, you'd think they'd spread it out a little bit. It's a bit obvious that um, it's one person uh, targeting the Osbot. And it'd be worth looking at other Osbot uh, videos that other people have done to see if they've also, the same four people, uh, have also commented at exactly the same time. Yeah, not the type of marketing we should admire. Anyway, I hope all this helps. Thanks very much for watching. Please like and subscribe.